I strive to bring you true stories from Japan, the like of which perhaps you haven't heard before. In addition to this, going forward, I would like to bring in some true crime stories, if they fit the theme of the video, or if they warrant their own video. So let's dive into a disturbing true story. But if true crime isn't your thing, and you just want to hear some scary true stories, there will be a timestamp link in the description. A man was arrested for confining a sleeping woman on the train in his apartment. In June of 2016, Kanagawa Prefectural Police announced the arrest of 33-year-old Yoshifumi Kurita. His arrest came on the suspicion of him confining a woman in his apartment in Sagamihara after he allegedly took her from a train while she was sleeping. Kurita was also suspected of abducting four other women from the last trains of the night, and he admitted to drugging at least one of them. Kurita, who was 33 and was working as a temporary worker at the time, said, I forced the drunk woman to drink a sleeper-inducing agent by claiming it was medicine for motion sickness. Police said street surveillance camera footage near Kurita's apartment showed him walking and holding a woman who looked dizzy on the morning of June the 4th. The victim claimed that she took the train home from a night out in the early hours of June the 4th and woke up to find herself in an apartment in Sagamihara. Kurita was present in the apartment when she woke up, but she said that she found an opportunity to escape and took it. She said that Kurita let his guard down and she was able to run to a nearby convenience store and called the police. As I mentioned before, the suspect was questioned for four other related incidents. Some of these cases dating back to 2015. In all cases, the female victims, who said that they had been drinking, reported waking up in a male stranger's room after they fell asleep taking the last train of the night in Tokyo or Kanagawa Prefecture. Police believed that Kurita may have been riding trains, specifically looking for women who had passed out due to drinking too much. Now this story disturbed me. In my many years of living in Japan, I have seen many female passengers alone, half drunk or asleep. To think that someone was preying on this vulnerability, it makes my blood boil. This isn't where the story ends though, because in September of 2016, Kurita was arrested for the third time on suspicion of the very same crime. He brought a female office worker back to his apartment. When arrested, he admitted to his crime. This time, he kept the woman confined until 7pm the next day. Kurita admitted to using the same method to deceive and abduct the office worker. He gave her a pill for motion sickness, which was really a sedative. So he was freed to commit the same crimes? I couldn't believe it when I read that, but little did I know there was something more sinister around the corner. Kurita, when interviewed, claimed to have done this disgusting last train of the night abduction act hundreds of times. At the end of September of 2016, Kurita stood trial, and while he denied some claims, he said that the main motivating force to abduct these sleeping women was because he wanted to touch their hair. He claimed this not to be for obscene purposes. The defense claimed that Kurita had developed a strong attachment to women's hair since the age of five, and since he was in high school he would ride the late night trains searching for drunk or sleeping women on Saturdays and Sundays. The district court determined the crime to be born of the illness of sexual addiction. Although not all details have been revealed, there are allegations of Kurita going beyond touching the female passenger's hair. He has been accused of indecent photography. Then, in November of 2018, Kurita was formally charged for rape and something called obscene predatory charges against nine women. Although he was charged for nine victims, Kurita himself assumes the more accurate figure 
to be around 300. He said his desires escalated from simply touching the hair of a sleeping or passed out woman on the train late nights in his teens, to bringing a woman back to his home and sleeping with her in the bed. He said that he would stroke her hair and smell her in those instances. His obsession with hair began when he left his foster home. Everything was so different. Seeing all those women and girls with long black hair on the station platform shocked me. The suspect was quoted. Kurita, who was sentenced to 16 years in prison, complained that his sentence was too short, stating the following chilling remark. If nothing is done, then I'm certain I will re-offend. This was my first look into true crime, and there are a lot more details out there on this case. So please let me know if you think it would be worth me making a full-length video on this case. If there's enough interest, I will do it. Anyway, let's go on to some true, scary, last train home stories. Thanks for listening. We have all likely heard of airdrop, right? It's pretty common these days, and most smartphones have this capability. Just in case you aren't familiar with it, AirDrop is a function used to share files such as photos, videos, URLs, and documents. If you are connected by Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, people who aren't on your contact list can share files with you. Although it is considered very useful by most, it can be very dangerous and frightening to others. There have been reports of people using the airdrop function on late night trains to send indecent images to fellow passengers. We call these people in Japan airdrop chikan. In English, airdrop pervs. This disgusting act has become widespread of late. So, this is a scary incident which happened via airdrop. It didn't happen to me, but a co worker at my company. He worked for a temp agency. Every night he would catch the last train home. It was always a pretty crowded train. By the way, our office is located in Ikebukuro. One night he was able to get a seat. This was rare on this train. He said that he was idly scrolling through his social media on his phone, feeling as if he was about to fall asleep when he saw a new banner notification on his phone. It was a notification of an incoming airdrop. Due to reflexes and perhaps tiredness, he tapped on the banner and approved the airdrop. The file he received was just a solid black picture. He wondered if someone had sent it by accident. However, the very next night he was travelling back home, when his phone alerted him to another incoming airdrop. Out of pure curiosity, he accepted it again. It was the same black image. He thought that whoever had sent this image the day before was on the train with him again. It creeped him out a bit, since he no longer considered it an accident. The next night, just as he and perhaps you might have thought, he received another black image via airdrop. He looked around the train to see if he could see anyone looking his way, or to see if anyone was looking as if they had received the same strange file. Why send just a black image? What's the intention behind it, he wondered. He considered the idea that he might have gotten a stalker. He knew that whatever it was, wasn't going to be good news. He said that he was becoming a bit frightened at this point. He said that he spoke to his co-workers about this, and one co-worker showed him how to block airdrops from third parties. Now, he shouldn't be able to receive any more unwanted files. That was good, but it didn't solve the mystery of who had been sending him that black image each night. His co-worker said that he had a friend who was a specialist in photography, and he could ask him to take a look at the black photo. He was more than happy to share the black photo if it helped solve the mystery, so he sent it to his colleague. The next night, he was on the last train home, watching everyone with the eyes of suspicion. He said that he felt very uncomfortable. He felt as if someone was watching him. 
He came into work the following day, and his colleague came over to him. Hey, you know that image that you asked my friend to take a look at? He began. His colleague said that they had found something disturbing when they played with the brightness, contrast, and hue of the black photo. They said they had found something hidden in it. His co-worker showed him what was beneath the photo, and he said that he gasped. There was a creepy-looking abandoned building. The photo seemed to be taken internally. There were these charms and talisman plastered all over the walls. He said that he felt something so inherently disturbing and evil about the photo that he just had to erase it. I scolded him for this, since I really wanted to see the photo. He said that nothing has happened, but he is very wary when riding the train late at night. He always thinks that someone is watching him. I often wonder why someone chose to send him that image. Was it a clue to some sort of crime? Or was it some sort of invitation? This happened a couple of years ago, when I went out with a bunch of friends for some drinks. I ended up staying later than I wanted, which resulted in me dashing for the last train home. Thankfully, I made it in time. The train started off being quite packed, but eventually it emptied out. It was great to get a seat, since I was pretty worse for wear. Before long, it was just me and some old salary man. He was wearing a white shirt and tie, as well as business slacks. We were sitting at different ends of the train, but on the same side of the train. You know, not opposite one another. He was asleep when I glanced over. Since I was tipsy, I shut my eyes for a couple of seconds. Maybe five or six at a guess. Not a long amount of time. When I opened my eyes, I saw him. It seemed as if he had moved a few seats up towards me. At this point, I didn't know if it was because I was a little drunk, and forgot where he was sat, so against my better judgement, I kind of ignored it, and before I knew it, I had closed my eyes again. Just like before, I only had my eyes shut for a couple of seconds before I opened them again. This time I opened them because I felt a bit uncomfortable. I realised the source of my unease. There was no mistaking it this time. He had moved up the rows of seats closer towards me. This was weird and creepy. I thought this guy might be looking to pickpocket me. I was drunk and full of confidence for some reason, so I thought that I would be the hero that this train needed. I decided to pretend to be asleep, and when I caught him in the act of attempting to rob me, I would turn him over to the station staff. Just as I suspected, as soon as I closed my eyes, he got up and stood in the centre of the train. He didn't approach me like I thought he would, though. Something weirder happened. Something that I will never forget. The man just stood there, in the middle of the carriage, and spun around and around. I watched this through half-open eyes, wondering what the hell was going on, and questioning myself if I was imagining it or not, or even dreaming it. Then he started to speak. Well chant, I suppose, is more accurate. It went something like this. You can't trick me. You can't trick me. Pretend to be asleep, but you can't trick me. Horrible seconds crawled by as I listened to him shuffling around and murmuring his weird chant. I was still pretending to be asleep. I mean, I didn't have much other choice. His chant grew louder and angrier. His footsteps turned to stomps, and then the train pulled into a station. I saw my chance, and I bolted out of the train. It was too much for me. I waited until the last seconds before the train's doors closed to make a break for it, so he wouldn't have a chance to follow me. This resulted in me walking over two hours home in the dark, but anything was better than being on that train with him.
This happened in the summer of 1986, or maybe 1987. Some friends and I wanted to go climb Mount Tanigawa. And how you would do that back in the day would be to take the train from Ueno to Echigozawa. If you set off at around 11, then you could be at Doai Station for about midnight. Now this station was an interesting one. Not only was it a great place to begin the hike up the mountain, but there was no bullet train around this time, and no resort like there is now. It's now called Gala Yuzawa. Back then the rules were a little more relaxed, and there were ways to bend the rules in your favour. Let's say if you boarded the train at the point that I did, that you wouldn't have to show your ticket to anyone, or even buy a ticket. Doai Station was an unmanned station, so it really was an easy place for people to get off without having their tickets checked. So all anyone had to do was just bolt down the stairs. I heard from some friends that the only time attendees turned up was to check the tickets when a train arrived, not departed. And that really wasn't that often. I was there with two friends, two fellow mountain climbers. I will refer to them as T and H. Since we were students and we weren't rich, we thought that if we spent the night at the unmanned station, we would save some money and avoid some train fares. We watched all the other commuters, mainly hikers, disappear. We had a plan to get up early and be on the first train out before the ticket checkers would be there. The plan was foolproof, right? The train we needed would depart from the underground. It was incredibly cool down there, even though it was summer. We could hear random drips echoing from the tunnel the train passes through. There was a small waiting room by the station platform. It was nice and bright in there, so at least we had a light source. We decided to head in there and take a nap since we had gotten a little cold. We dragged all of our luggage in there and hunkered down for the night. Several freight trains passed through in the middle of the night. I remember waking up as they roared by and wondered where I was each time. I hate that feeling. I was mildly annoyed that I seemed to be the only one who woke up each time. I can't remember what time in the night it was, but I woke up again to hear the sound of footsteps echoing around the empty platform. I focused on the sound and tried to pinpoint the location of the footsteps, and they sounded as if they were approaching the waiting room. Someone's coming, but who, I wondered. I decided to lie still just in case it was a member of staff or another hiker looking for a chat or something to borrow. The footsteps stopped outside the waiting room. At this point I imagined that whoever was out there was another person looking for a place to sleep for the night. Awkward seconds tumbled into minutes. I couldn't hear any further footsteps. How long will they wait outside? I didn't get a hint or sign that this person was about to enter the waiting room. It was annoying, so I popped my head up and looked towards the entrance. There was no one there. My spine froze. The whole waiting room seemed to have grown cold in the blink of an eye. Did I mishear those footsteps? Did I imagine them? I didn't mind which option, just as long as I was able to convince myself of one. I started to sweat. Time trickled by without incident. I thought about changing my shirt since I felt gross, but I couldn't be bothered as I was so tired. I ended up falling asleep. A while later I awoke again. This time I could hear a man's voice speaking in a low tone, mumbling or muttering. This was dovetailed with his heavy breathing. I opened my eyes wide. I couldn't make out the words the voice was whispering at first. After a while I made out words such as please and let me. It sounded as if he was asking for someone or something. His voice had an undercurrent of sorrow to it, like he was in pain. I wondered if it was someone outside the waiting room who couldn't get in. So again I sat up and looked towards the entrance, and I couldn't see anyone there. The fluorescent light was flickering above my head. I could still hear this mumbling, pain-stricken voice. I started to feel sick seasick, like the room was spinning. Is this a dream? I wondered, or perhaps hoped. Maybe it was my imagination, since I hadn't been sleeping much on this trip. My friend, H, started twitching in his sleep. I started to worry about him, so I shook him awake. 
He woke up and inhaled and exhaled deeply. Oh, sleep paralysis, I am so glad you woke me. I don't want to go to sleep again. Oh, are you staying awake? He looked petrified. There shouldn't be anyone else down here but us this time of night. Or was it early morning? It was far too early for a member of staff to be here. We woke up tea and decided, as a group, to head to the overground section of the station. We didn't want to be underground anymore. We grabbed all our heavy hiking gear and turned towards the 500 or so stone steps, sighed, and started to climb them. Without any gear, it takes about 20 minutes to climb these stairs. Just as a side note, T told us before that there was a rumor that if you counted the steps on the way down, then you would meet an accident climbing Mount Tanigawa. As we climbed back up the stairs, not counting them of course, we felt hot air being blown our way from above ground. When we finally got to the top of the stairs, we saw a few other climbers sleeping in the station. They must have had the same idea as us. I didn't know exactly what time it was, but I knew that it was one of those dark hours before dawn. We settled down close to the other climbers and I felt a bit less tense. H pulled out his camping stove and set about boiling some water. I guess it was an early breakfast for us. We didn't have much else to do. Did you guys sleep alright last night? H asked. He then proceeded to tell us that he had a disturbing and frightening dream in the underground. He said that he thought he heard the sound of someone walking towards where we were sleeping. In his dream, he said he saw someone peering at us with a look of such unspeakable terror on their face. It was a man. He couldn't remember what he was wearing, but he was certain that the man was staring at us. When he met the eyes of the man looking in on us, he said that he had never seen a face so desperate. He said that the dream troubled him so much because he was unable to help or understand the reason behind that man's glare. He recognized it as desperation and utter horror. This was really out of character for H. He was older than us and I had never known him to lie. He never bragged or tried to pull pranks either. This is why I got such chills when he recounted a similar story to what happened to me without me telling him what had happened. We were silent while we ate breakfast for a while. I didn't want to talk anymore. I was exhausted and still shaken up. H then said while eating, Many people go missing in this area. I bet a lot of them meet with foul play. With that, we all stayed silent and we fell asleep as the sun was rising in front of the ticket gate. We were all severely lacking in sleep. We woke up when the station started to get a little busier. This was the first time in this station I didn't mind getting awoken. We were happy to get the hell out of there. I could understand if it was just my experience, but the fact that H had the same experience as me, that is something that's always frightened me. I got a call from a friend the other night. He said he was on his way home from working late at the office. This was nothing too out of the ordinary. On the phone he kept saying that he was on the train and he didn't recognize the train stations he was passing. Well I thought that he just had had a couple of beers outside a convenience store or something and he was a little buzzed. He said, and I'll always remember this, he said that he didn't like the names of the stations he was passing through. He said that he was waiting for the last train home and it didn't arrive. An older model of a train pulled in and he hopped on board. He said that the train was basically empty and he loved the idea of that since he could catch up on some sleep in peace. He said that there were others on the train but they seemed to be asleep and they were lying down. After a while he said that he was getting scared because some of them hadn't moved for a while. He wanted to get off at the next available station and figure out a different way home. I told him to stay on the train and wait for a station that sounded familiar. 
Then, the phone line abruptly cut. I haven't been able to contact him since this happened. I wonder what's happened to him. I will entertain any theories if you have them. I just need closure. <laughs>